Hey, and welcome back to the podcast. We're here with Bob Pellerin, who is the author of AI Business Strategies, Leveraging Artificial Intelligence as a Competitive Advantage. And Bob has so much history and so many skills. He's all about employee engagement. He's worked for the U.S. Navy, and he has this natural ability to think outside the box when faced with unique issues. And in this day and age of cloud computing and artificial intelligence and approaching the singularity, we are sure as heck filled with all this fast-paced, uh, unpredictable, unique issues. So let's talk about that. So, Bob, glad to see you. It's a pleasure being here with you, Robert. So thanks for inviting me. Glad to have you. And so we introduced you a little bit there, but if someone said, what's this Bob Pellerin guy all about? What makes him tick? What is the 30 to 60 second elevator pitch? Uh, well, look, I've got a, a very varied background. Um, I, look, I've worked for Microsoft. I've worked for Micron in the US, uh, Micron PC more specifically. And one of my fortes has always been uh, this going from both a high end where I've been like director of technology for some law firms. I've been CTO, CIO and things like that. Uh, but I also like to get my hands dirty. So I really like to be out in the field, out coding out. I mean, I got code less and less, but I really like to get a pulse as to both the technology and, and the requirements of the industries on the other end. And uh, this is actually what sort of brought it together. And when AI came out, I worked on multiple projects uh, worked with, uh, for example, a company called Vocodia.com out there that is doing an AI. I get into that in a few minutes if you'd like. Uh, but we work on AI projects, and it dawned on me that the majority of executives out there really don't have a good idea as to how you use this technology. And ChatGPT came after I've been working with all these different technologies. And so a lot of people associate AI with strictly a ChatGPT type of you know chatting you know, robot that you can talk to, and it really does not suffice to, you know, to really explain or explore what AI can do for your enterprise or for your business or your project. And so this is a great opportunity for you to educate us, set us right. And I can definitely understand how chat GPT has just become sort of the, the default example, because that's kind of a, an easy demo. It's easy to grasp and it's exciting. You can whip out your phone and then you send them a message and see what pops up. And then when you try to get kind of off that path, when you explain like generative images or like more of like the predictive stuff with like with like customer data and like drawing conclusions from like huge data sets. And when you hear about how they like uh, they use it in space, like for like to like image black holes, it's less uh, like common man, exciting, tougher to like explain the demo. So you're saying that, you know, we've been using AI for for years, for decades, and it has all these other uses. So what's a more like appropriate way to explain AI and how it helps us? Uh, look, I really see AI more as a, you know, the back end tool. People should not be aware that AI is there assisting them, but um, somebody asked me the other day, what are you going to do for a follow-up for a book? I'm going to bring this up because I think it's relevant as the way I think about AI. And I was saying, well, really, it's think about the future. If we wanted to simplify life, for example, you're a crane operator. I mean, that's a pretty straightforward job. What if you're a little, you know, if a couple inches or a couple centimeters, depending where you are, off of your mark? And maybe there could be cameras somewhere that you know verify and could assist the operator in making sure that you are hitting your load directly exactly where it's supposed to be every single time i mean so this you know sort of one extreme obviously when you get things to uh, to cars where you've got ai built in i mean everybody will think of tesla uh but again uh, you know it keeps you in your lane it might help you uh prevent you from speeding potentially i think you know a lot of drivers maybe you get a little distracted maybe you're stepping on the gas a little too much you don't realize it well this could compensate and of course it could help you save gasoline in the future um you know for not all electric that is and by the end of the day, it's going to go all the way to potentially surgeries. And imagine you're doing a surgery and there, you know, something's been forgotten in the patient. Um, uh, you know, I've seen and heard a lot of different things. And, and these are the things that might happen. We've got scenarios where people are bleeding out something, you know, everybody's in a, you know, I won't say in a panic because they're professionals, but you do, you can add sort of an extra set of eyes, um, not, you know, literally, but you can literally have a, an extra brain there thinking remotely you know not thinking about the situation at hand you might be panicking and dealing with whatever the situation is but if you've got this extra assistant in the back saying by the way now that you're done now that the patient is you know under control don't forget this 
So, you know, it goes back to almost a chat GPT where it keeps giving you darn lists. I mean, at first it's great. And then at some point you start saying, well, lists are nice, but how do we actually get the content? How do we actually get to the details? Well, this is, you know, keeping you in the lane or keeping things out of you know, patients, make sure that they're uh, sewn up and there's nothing they'll get a you know an infection from and so forth i think is, is very important and and this is why in the book i've got tons and tons of example and that was more of the point because i didn't want to really go into the mechanics of it uh let's face it it's like coding i mean i could sit down and tell you oh let me explain to you what the code looks like for a website or what the code looks like for a salesforce.com it really is irrelevant to the majority of people they don't care what language you use you don't care about any of those things what you care is what does it deliver and how does it work? You get in your car and you turn your key, you you more or less don't really care if there's cylinders and how the gas gets injected and any of those things. So what you want to do is really get a feel for what do I use this tool for? You know, the pencil is, is very useful, but you need to know how to write or draw or do something with it. And that's really the inspiration that the core human aspect of it to me is the thing that will drive AI moving forward. That makes a lot of sense that it is a tool just like any other, and it won't necessarily do the work for you, it, especially with ChatGPT. It looks at first like it will, right? Like, well, write me an article about this. And then you said it writes a big list or once you actually read what it writes, it's kind of just uh, like writing like a, a third grade book report. Like it's just kind of like adding a bunch of filler and then it's up to you to go in there and refine it. But I like your kind of mindset here of how the AI can just be like an assistant in a lot of ways. Like my son is three and I imagine someday he can just get in a, a a car without a driver's license and just not even know how to drive a car, but it will like keep you from, from killing someone or, or from crashing it just because it does all the monitoring. And a few weeks ago, I, I talked to a guy who was uh, in like the food safety industry and he was geeking out about like, man, if AI could have cameras and like alert if someone forgot to wash their hands or like check the, all these like temperatures of this food in this refrigeration and just like and, and that made a lot more sense to me when you say well instead of the ai being this magic box that just does everything it's just like it, it monitors or does all these repetitive tedious tasks and when you combine it then that's kind of where the, the magic happens and so uh, as far as I think anyone that I know, including myself, that's used ChatGPT has gone through like the frustration, right? There's the initial page of like, oh, this is cool. When you try to use it, you get frustrated. But then when you kind of finally settle in that mindset of like, okay, it's a tool, it's an assistant, it's like a, a pocket calculator, it won't do all of it for you, then that seems to be less irritating because we, we kind of manage our expectations better. It's going to get a little murky down the road because you, you will find applications that really can work on their own some or appear to work on their own uh, such as automation i do work with the food industry i do work with a lot of uh, you know different industries um let me go back to vocody as a perfect example it is a call center so instead of being a chat ai it's basically a talk it's we call it a dissa and what it's doing is it's basically a digital assistant that will go out and call so as a sales agent and the interesting part is as opposed to a robocall because robocalls are really just you know, pre-programmed scripts. And the problem there is if you call me and you say, do you have life insurance? And I say, you know, my sister used to have life insurance. Well, how is that relevant? How, I mean, the robot, you know, just the typical script would just continue whatever it is you say. It's nice outside. Irrelevant, but the script would just keep going. And then it becomes more and more awkward till it hang up on you. Uh, as in, if you have, uh, you know, natural AI, you can train the AI and with the beautiful thing about that is think about it. If you've got, I don't know, 100,000 instantaneous calls all at the same time, why? Because you don't have operators. You don't have to have, look, I need to call these 10,000 people. Well, now I need to find my call center and perhaps they have 500 uh, people that are sitting and they need the equipment, they need the PBX, they need you know everything to be able to operate. And maybe in the morning, they're really enthusiastic. And guess what happens by the evening? They really get depressed because everybody's told them no and then what if in the middle of the day you decide hey everybody's asking to use this product on their dogs it's not approved so now you've got to train you got it midway through you got to tell everybody by the way don't let them use this product on their pets for example ai is not a problem you can literally go in and say oh not suitable for pets bam it knows what a pet is you want to talk about your goldfish someone else says dog not a problem it's all it's you know completely under control and what's nice about a lot of these technologies uh, sort of like the sci-fi books and so forth, you're going to end up with laws or 
you know, special programs. In some cases, what a lot of these firms are doing is they're actually using a secondary AI to monitor the first one. So you'll have guidelines. I mean, if you're in an industry where, for example, you were saying if there's monitoring in the food industry and somebody drops, I don't know, creative apples on the ground, well, if it spots the person just putting them back on the line, big no-no, well, then it needs to alert, needs to do something. So all these things can be trained. And of course, when you've got high automation, it doesn't hurt to have extra features in the background, you know, whether they be scrubbers to make sure that all the data is fine. Uh, you want to make sure that the AI doesn't start to learn um, things that just really are outside the scope of where you want it to be. Because unfortunately, because it learns, it can be deceived. If you have call 10,000 people and you ask them who's the president of the United States and they all start saying, um, you know, some nonsense, not to <laughs> point anybody out, but um, you could potentially later on go back and say, to the AI, who's the president, and all of a sudden get a wrong answer because it suddenly thought, hey, everybody seems to be saying it's you know Donald Duck. Well, it must be Donald Duck. So you could in inadvertently get wrong information. So it does still require sort of human knowledge and human interaction with it on the back end to make sure that these things don't go off the rails. In, in a production environment, strictly, uh, you know, whether it's a production line making widgets, uh, it's not that obvious because all the data it's receiving are really parameters, whether it be weight, whether it be, uh, you know, packaging the ceiling, the, you know, the stickers, uh, you know, are they coming off on the other end? Maybe there's another you know machine that checks to make sure that everything went into the box had a sticker on it and, and can correct the original AI uh, so that the production improves as opposed to, you know, things fly off and no one notices. That is interesting to think about is as far as giving it the bounds or like you were saying, like maybe have like different specially tasked uh, AI. And like, you're making me think that um, like, I know a, a guy who has some kind of like a, like an AI dashboard product. And there's like, there's like two layers, right? And there's like the logic layer and the AI layer. And somehow the, like the AI like codes the logic or like the logic does what's what's simple and straightforward and the AI does other tasks. And so that's interesting to think about that. You're not just necessarily like, it's not like Terminator or Skynet, you're not just handing over the, the keys. You say, well, here's my, my task and here's what I'm trying to have it accomplish. And I'm not just letting it loose because the AI can be inaccurate. And you hear that a lot about like, you know, going back to chat GPT, right? The stereotypical example, it hallucinates, it adds things. If you ask it a math problem, it might get the math problem wrong. And like, I've used it to help me out with like generating Excel formulas. And I'm like, well, I've got the this text in these cells and here's a few examples and I want the output to be this. And it would like, kind of get it right and i would be like well here's some other cases and i felt like like you were saying when we started a conversation like getting back into like the the debugging programming mode but it's more in like a like an english based debugging instead of just coding so it's just like a just a different uh kind of kind of problem to solve and so uh there's so much to think about uh at, but what has surprised you in these last few years because it, you always kind of hear about uh this the crazy things are happening and like in, insane problems are solving. It can detect cancer. It can look at like x-rays and MRIs. But in all the things that you've seen, has anything surprised you these last few years? Um, surprised me? No, I've been at this for quite a while. Uh, as you mentioned, I actually worked on with the University of Montana a long, long time ago. And it wasn't called artificial intelligence then. Uh, it was called Benzian uh, you know, something or other at that time. And really, it was more mathematics. So if you went to the common person and said, hey, look what we've got. Uh, in fact, that's pretty much what happened, because my job at the time was to take these technologies and commercialize them. So imagine me walking, you know, cold calling large corporations and saying, hey, I've got this thing. And, and we weren't calling it artificial intelligence. And even then, people would, you know, stare at this and go, ah, what do I need this for? And at the time I was working um, with Visa and, and my job was to convince them to use uh, this to process applications. So in my mind, it was, okay, something that someone designed to work in a torpedo can suddenly get different data and get credit card applications and can suddenly give you patterns, can suddenly give you information as to, is this a good application or a bad application? Why is it good? Well, maybe you notice that everybody who's a dog pays better, or maybe, I mean, I'm making stuff up, but the point is you do end up with weird little patterns uh, when you get to a certain point in the data set. And the more data you have, the more, you know, and, and we can apply this. I'm, I'm working with a company called Sanus uh, right now, and Sanus is 
one of the things they want to do is gather basically have a digital ocean so have as much data on medic you know medical uh conditions as possible and treatments as well so you go back and if you can start to correlate to see patterns imagine the power of that to say hey what a weird coincidence where you know all these people took this other drug for you know maybe they had headaches and took uh, some kind of you know pain reliever or something like that and maybe you're starting to see patterns to say hey this this seems to have made it worse or maybe this made it better or maybe this you know evolved into something else so the idea is that you can tap in, into this to find uh, new and innovative ways of looking at data and, and honestly i wish i wish that ai was better at being sort of a, a front end for a database because that would make life easier i mean imagine if you could like you said if you're doing a research you're a lawyer for example and you say hey i need to go to court and i need to research this uh ai pretends to be good at this but unfortunately i think it was on the radio recently that some lawyer handed in something to a judge and it said you know based on the following cases and those cases were just <laughs> non-existent and it was based on laws and articles such and, and there was no such article in the law so imagine uh, scenarios where um, you know this i mean the law you can kind of get over it to some degree unless there's a you know an actual judgment in which case you've got weird problems because now you got to go back and say oh the opposing counsel gave us a BS there. It's we can't use this, but I, I think we're going to tweak this as a you know as a society. We're going to create new norms as to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And I think the government at some point will have to regulate it somewhat so that I don't end up having um, you know a fake you, for example, interviewing and making you say anything I want because of the deep fakes and all the rest of those aspects. You combine that with AI. And it could be a, a live conversation with a non-person. And I mean, I understand why the actors are up and uh, you, know, you can replicate people's faces and likeness and voices. It really does get annoying. And there is an AI, by the way, that sounds just like me. And it's funny because it sounds, uh, Bacodia did this at one point. They needed a French speaking AI and they asked me if they could use my voice. And they just went ahead and took some of my YouTube videos because I have like over you know, 200 of them. And they found some that I was speaking in French and they had the machine call me back and talk to me in French. It was funny because they had a different French accent. I'm from Canada and this French accent was from somewhere in Paris. But it was it was you know very funny. I taped it and I played it for my parents and my parents said, oh, that's you. And I said, no, no, I, I don't have this accent. And they said, yeah, but that's you taking a funny accent. It's like, no, it's it's a robot. It's, you know, <laughs> try explaining AI to uh, someone who's over 80. It's a little, you know, challenging. And but also scary because like like you said, there there's like a a good and an evil side to all of this, right? Like you can uh, make those ten thousand cold calls all at once, or like a, a few years ago, I think I was maybe like five six years ago, I was blown away when Google demoed something where they were calling all the restaurants in the area to like update the business hours and like their metadata. And they played this demo where like they called like a, a Chinese restaurant and the lady answering had a really thick accent. And, and the guy was like, Hey, what are your hours? And I'd like to make your reservation on like for Wednesday for four people. And she even misheard him. And he's like, no, I didn't say that two, or I didn't say it like four for two people. I said it two for four people and the AI like corrected her. And I was just like blown away at as far as it would kind of him and ha and say, um, and pause for a second. And it kind of had all those things that you would expect for an AI. So that's kind of the plus, but then the, the bad are like the, the chat bots or the deep fakes when uh, there's even been some of these stories that I've seen where there would be this obviously AI art generated like to someone you and me were like clearly that's a cartoon but you show it to someone who and who knows if it's just like bad eyesight or like our dementia or just they're not used to the technology but especially this elderly population they would show them these clearly AI generated photos with even like the wrong number of fingers and the the elderly person would like be convinced that like this thing really happened so like that's scary. And this is even in the early technology. And imagine when it's so detailed, when like even our own human retina is not detailed enough to, to tell that it's a fake. That's some kind of exciting, but also scary times ahead. And so with all of this kind of thinking about the like the past and the present and, and all that, what do you think is in store for the future? I mean, there's like the, the pie in the sky, like techno technological kind of Thing, but as far as like the practical usage, as far as just like, you know, making money and having better businesses, what do you see in the future as far as us using AI to have like better businesses and better lives? 
Look, I, I think the AI should be integrated into as many things as we can get uh, right now. Uh, think about it. If you've got accounting and firms, whether it's uh, accounts payable, accounts re receivables and so forth, uh, we can enhance all of those things because I think a lot of companies, uh, look, I was on a call this morning and they're inundated by emails and they're all, and the trickery out there, unfortunately, it's as, as a human, it's kind of frustrating because you have so many people adding, you know, to the technology requirements. Now you're not just worried about actual real things coming in, but you've, you're getting some fake, uh, you know, invoices and you're getting fake requests to change your bank accounts, things like that. So a, a whole, a lot of that can be made, um, to be changed uh, or to be processed by an AI and could be enhanced in the sense that you could have a certain meter that would tell you, you know, is this likely to be fake? Is this likely to be real? Is this even a client? Is this, so imagine if you got an email from me and it would automatically say, hey, this is Bob, you've dealt with Bob before. This is where you know him from and so forth. So at least right off the bat, you say, okay, it's a known person. He's writing to me from a known account. He's giving the right, you know, contact information and you can sort of go, from there and at, at that point obviously at some point it if, if i'm asking for money it's up to you to call me back to say hey are you really requesting this if it's unusual or something like that because i do look i i keep getting friends that uh, it's so crazy i had one that uh i knew his son was going off to uh europe at some point and i got an email a week later saying hey i'm in paris and i had a problem and then stole my credit cards and stole this can you please pay for my you know i came to visit my son and they had a lot of information and at the end of the day um, I just called him and I said, so you're in France? He said, no. So <laughs> it was just, I mean, it was one of those uh, social hacks that they keep using, but it, it was from his account. It, it's, it, but it all sounded very plausible within the context because I knew it was a good possibility he could have gone there. So imagine now with AI, if I can scrub the internet on information on you, and if I know, for example, that you have a daughter and she has you posted a post somewhere on Facebook or somewhere like that, that uh, you bring her to ballet every Tuesday, well, no, maybe I can generate your voice, call someone and say, oh, I was at my daughter, she had maxed them in the hospital, can you please send me some money, I need to, whatever. And, and all of a sudden, you're going to get the context with the social engineering problem and it's going to be harder and harder for us to react properly, especially when you get the proper voices to go with it. Then it's up to us to call back, say, well, maybe he's on a different number because he's at the hospital. I mean, I'm making this stuff up, obviously. But the point is, it, it will be coming more and more challenged. On the flip side, if I may sort of predict and go beyond this uh, to try to keep this brief, so I can go on for, for hours. But uh, imagine a point where we get assistance from AI in almost every aspect. Like I, make it, I mentioned a crane and all that. At some point, if technology does break down or if we have social unrest and, you know, for budgetary reasons, all of a sudden we can't maintain the AIs or we can't, something happens to along that effect, we're going to end up with a crazy need where we're going to need uh, to bring in people from other countries that weren't reliant on the AI to take over. I mean, we're seeing this, for example, migrant workers right now where, hey, we've, you know, as a society, we've decided that no one likes to pick tomatoes or to do whatever it is. I mean, a lot of these uh, you know, these these jobs that are critical. And somehow we're already in a position where we're having to have people come in to do them because they got, you know, they haven't gotten used to tractors or automated, you know, picking uh, machines and whatnot. So if ever there's a, ch a change in our economic situation, you know, big recession, all of a sudden companies come back, because uh, people don't seem to understand and realize that all this AI technology, as great as it is, it's costing money, it's costing resources, it's, it needs water cooling, it needs, so there's all this back end. And if we're all just using chat GPT, I'm just using that one as an example, but if we all start using it daily, continually, um, it's just going to increase the cost somewhere, right? I mean, if you're holding emails, whether it be in a Microsoft environment or Google environment and whatnot, all that has a cost. It's creating carbon, it's creating, so from the environment point of view, even if we just take the economics out, uh, it's a difficult process for us to keep growing this forever. So we have to be mindful of this. And I think AI can help us, but at some point we can't think of it as a free, you know, out of the ether, just extra service or extra brain that we can suddenly uh, call upon like a calculator. You know, it's calculator has a built-in cost when you purchase that, but once you have it, it keeps working. AI is just an ongoing and it needs more and more data. And what's really scary is the fact that now they've got systems, AI systems, producing data to feed the other AI, AI so it learns, and so it has even more data because it's they're running out of things to put into it, as crazy as that sounds.
and you're not even getting yet into the uh when they Microsoft had multiple AIs and they were talking to each other in their own made up language and they were like, no, sh shut it down. We don't even know what they're saying. Uh, so it just seems like there are many obstacles ahead and, and that's okay because, you know, you take things one day at a time and we'll see what those obstacles when we get to them. Uh, and then there's even like the, like that aspect of, um, like you said, like people will not know how to do some tasks and it might put some people out of jobs. And then like Bill Gates at one point was talking about like taxing the, the robots uh, to make up for all of that, that lost work. And so, man, just the future will be very weird, but that's OK. And that's fun. And that's things to look forward to and be excited about. So if someone says, man, I, we can't even fit it all in, into one podcast. But if someone if they're if the, the itch is there and they say, I want to find out more about what Bob has going on in fiction and, and nonfiction and his YouTube channel that he mentioned, and just with all of this uh, kind of learning and teaching about AI, how can someone take that next step with you? How can they learn more about you? And where's the websites at? Well, clearly, I, I do write sci-fi because I'm I'm driven. That's my out of the box thinking, uh, leading me to write stories. And a lot of time, I want to you know sort of make comments on society, and I can't, so I. I write science fiction that no one will uh, take it too personally. Uh, my author site is bobpellin.com. You can also visit ctobob.com, which is, um, you know, sort of a mixture of my YouTube videos. I try to incorporate whatever I enjoy back out on YouTube as well. So if you want to check out Bob Pellerin, or you can look up CTO Bob as well on YouTube. Uh, like I said, I think I've got about 200 videos and I keep making them. They're a mixture of technologies. and I do a lot of like, you know, VMware and stuff like that. Um, for the AI, obviously, the book is available on Amazon.com or whichever country you're in on Amazon. And it's got an audio book by a very excellent narrator by name of uh, Robert Plank. So, w. <laughs> so thank you again for doing the narration for the audio book. It's, uh, it was very well received. And I actually released it in French because it is uh, in it's been charting since uh, last May uh, on a couple of uh, of charts on Amazon. So because of the amazing uh, feedback I got, I mean, I got invited to talk in Texas. I did a mastermind. So there is a lot of interest in here. Uh, at the end of the day, though, again, it goes back to it's the technologies are like fashion to me. They go in, they go out. Databases change and you know blockchain. I mean, there's always something new. There's always something that catches the eye. But at the end of the day, it is a tool. And if, if you have a need for it, which you probably do if you do accounting or deal with large amounts of emails and so forth, uh, you've got to educate yourself because if you don't, your competitor will. And they, you know, sooner or later, they'll be able to handle more uh, processing, just, you know, produce more with less, in you know, human uh, interaction. And they'll just get a leg up on you. Their costs will go down. And at some point, uh, they, you know, they'll take everybody out of business. So... It's, I think it behooves everyone to uh, follow up on AI and what's happening. I agree that it's an arms race. You need to get caught up and imagine if you were still doing long division with a, a pencil or using a slide rule or an abacus where everyone else is using a calculator or a spreadsheet or some kind of, you know, uh, cloud excel version or something and so it just it helps to stay on top of the tools that are out there and so people can find you by going to ctobob.com and also bob pellerin and also search bob pellerin on amazon to check out that book and that audiobook. And so as we're winding down our conversation here, Bob, we touched on all kinds of uh, topics, uh, all kinds of AI stuff. And it really like, it's it's so fun to think about uh, you kind of using your uh, kind of self-expression to make these videos and to experiment, to play around with new technology. And that's kind of a cool lesson to take away from. But as far as like the lesson that you want to tell us, if I were to ask you, if a quote, moral, or lesson comes to mind, just to wrap up our conversation here, does anything just pop to the surface as far as quote, moral, or lesson? It can be related or not related to what we talked about, but what kind of quote, moral, or lesson do you have just to end our conversation? Uh, <laughs> it's going to be the weirdest quote ever, except I think I'm going to quote something I wrote in one of my sci-fi books. Uh, the challenge with AI is I, I had a situation where I have the captain of the ship talking to an AI and, and it goes to the AI and says, look, you know, navigation is the most important thing. Nothing is more important than that. Put all your processing power to that. And the computer comes back and says, so nothing is more important. And he says, that's right. And then nothing happens. And so the second in command looks at him and said, uh, you just told him to do nothing. 
he said nice. nothing's more important right so nothing yeah so at the end of the day important. is how you interact with well that's it so so interpretation and and intent uh, i'm very big on context and intent that's going to be critical for us both you know government levels within companies because you can set these things to automate and you can find out very quickly how because again if you can call up 200,000 people instantaneously imagine if you kind of goofed and said oh wow we, we just we didn't name the product properly or, or some whatever it was I mean you, you could instantaneously have a nightmare it's almost like having a press conference and you just really messed up um it, it, this will sort of you know create the opposite problem or the opposite you know of a solution where it's supposed to ease your problems and reduce your costs well this could make things really bad really quickly for you so you just have to be mindful and of course it goes back to human planning human you have to understand what your product is who your target audience is and it goes back to that so i think at the end of the day know what you're doing know that you're servicing or you know what you're producing is uh, going to solve a problem out there and you have to aim for that and make sure that the AI also keeps within that context. I love it. That's very helpful to be aware, to be mindful in, in many contexts, but also that words matter. You have, you have one wrong word or just if you're careless, then that can really come back to bite you. And so to make sure that it does not come back to bite us, go right now to ctobob.com to stay aware and awake about these artificial intelligence developments. ctobob.com. Bob Pellerin, wonderful speaking with you. Thank you, Robert. It was a pleasure talking to you.